Over 4,000 years ago, something remarkable began in southern Iberia. The ancient Chalcolithic societies there came to an end and in their place emerged a powerful society that came to dominate the region for over 600 years. They lived in densely populated fortified hilltop settlements protected by strong walls and even higher towers. As well as homes, they had workshops, granaries and large meeting halls. This was a strictly hierarchical society ruled by powerful chieftains, or perhaps kings and queens, supported by a wealthy aristocracy, a labouring class and slaves. As well as their magnificent settlements, we know about the society because of their burial tradition. They interred their dead beneath the buildings of the settlements, in pits, stone boxes or in enormous ceramic jars. They were buried with standardised sets of grave goods that marked their age, sex and social rank within this society. The elite men were always given copper and bronze weapons, while the elite women wore gold or silver jewellery and sometimes beautiful silver diadems. They had trade links that extended across the Mediterranean to North Africa, the Aegean and the Near East and all the way across Europe to the Baltic. And, thanks to the latest in ancient DNA analysis, it's now possible to reconstruct not only the population level ancestry of these people, but also the relationships between the individuals buried in this intriguing way, shedding light into the kinship practices and social organisation of this Bronze Age society. So who were these people? Where did they come from? And how did they exert such tight control over their population and their culture for six centuries? and what ultimately led to their downfall. This is the amazing story of the Bronze Age rulers of Spain, what some have called the first state society in Western Europe, the El Agar culture. Later in this video, we'll be talking about how genetic testing has helped to reveal not only the ancestry of the El Agar people, but their family relationships too. If you've ever wanted to find out about your own ancestry, then I'm pleased to tell you that on this video I've partnered with MyHeritage, a leading global family history and DNA service that makes exploring your family history easier than ever. The MyHeritage DNA test is easy to use. When you get the box, you do a simple cheek swab. It takes just two minutes and then you send it back. The results help you to discover your origins and find new relatives. I've done this and I'm happy to share my results. It gives you an ethnicity estimate by a percentage breakdown of your origins across 42 supported ethnicities and over 21,000 geographical regions. You can see mine is mostly English and almost a quarter Irish, which makes sense as most of my family is from England and I had an Irish grandmother. 23% Scandinavian though was a real surprise, but then I have found out from doing my family tree with my heritage that my ancestors worked in shipping on the northeast coast of England, so perhaps that's where those links were made. And I wonder where that small amount of Iberian ancestry came from. Whatever the answer, it's interesting considering the topic of this video is ancient Iberia. I'll have to explore these links further, and MyHeritage helps you find new relatives based on your shared DNA. You can see how much DNA you share with them and what their degree of relatedness is, and ancestral surnames common to you both. There's also this new feature called Theory of Family Relativity, where you might also find out where a DNA match could fit in your family tree. If you want to find out about your own ancestry like I have with MyHeritage, then please click the link in the description box to buy a DNA kit. Use the coupon code DAN for free shipping. And as an added bonus, you can start a 30-day free trial of MyHeritage's best subscription for family history research. Thank you to MyHeritage for sponsoring the video. The societies of Chalcolithic Iberia are epitomised by the wonderful site of Los Melares in Andalusia with its dispersed roundhouses and famous perimeter walls, which thrived for about a thousand years between 3200 and 2200 BC. Then quite suddenly, archaeologically speaking, these societies of southern Iberia came to an end and something new began in their place. So what caused this? Well, a fantastic 2021 paper that analysed DNA from human remains around this time helps to shed light on what happened. It looks like that starting around 2400 BC, new people moved into Iberia from the north, and by two centuries later, their descendants were in southern Iberia. The men were carrying the R1b Y haplogroup, and they were also associated with genes originating on the Eurasian steppe centuries earlier. 
and after 2200 BC, the male lineages of Chalcolithic Spain, those dating back thousands of years here, came to an end and were replaced almost exclusively by the R1b Y haplogroup. Now the researchers can't say for sure whether the new arrivals took advantage of societies that had already collapsed due to internal problems or if they caused the collapse themselves. But to me it seems like a tribe of Belbica culture men from northwest Europe steadily took over Iberia, extinguishing the existing male lineages in the process, while taking wives from the existing Iberian population. In fact, for the rest of the Bronze Age, basically every man in Iberia would carry variations of the R1b Y haplogroup, descending from a subclade originating in Central Europe. And then from 2200 BC, we see the beginning of the El Agar culture being established in the southeast. This was a new way of life, not like the earlier Chalcolithic societies and not entirely like the Bell Beaker culture either. For one thing, they didn't use those bell-shaped ceramic beakers like their ancestors did throughout much of Western Europe. So what was the El Agar culture, or the Agaric culture, exactly? Well, from 2200 BC, in southeast Iberia, these people established hilltop settlements, ranging from 1 to 6 hectares in size. The name of the culture comes from the site of El Agar, one of the most powerful and important settlements. Their settlements weren't just made up of houses, but included storage rooms, especially for barley, as well as workshops and meeting halls. Some of these buildings were several stories high. They also had fortifications and infrastructure, like huge reservoirs. The story of El Agar as a society is one of increasing complexity, growth and sophistication over the centuries. This is reflected in the settlements themselves. One of the most important settlements was a site known as La Bastida in Murcia, which covers 4.5 hectares on a hill 450 metres above sea level. Initially, between about 2200 and 2025 BC, the original buildings were small oval or circular huts, kind of like those at Los Milares, but also like some Belbica culture houses from the rest of Iberia. It's hard for the archaeologists to know too much about this first phase there because around 2025 BC, large parts of the settlement were destroyed by fire. The most interesting thing about this first phase is the massive fortifications they built to protect the settlement. The stonework walls, made from quarried sandstone blocks and clay mortar, were up to 3 metres wide and 5 to 6 metres high originally, that's 20 feet tall. In fact, some sections are still 4 metres high today. The walls were plastered with a yellow or violet bluish clay. What's more, the wall had these square, solid towers protruding from it. Wall towers had been seen on Chalcolithic defences like at Los Milares, but they were much further apart from one another. This is because the primary weapon used then was the bow and arrow. Warfare in the El Agar culture, however, did not rely on bows, but on hand-to-hand -hand weapons. The men defending the walls from these towers would have had to knock attackers off the walls with spears and halberds. There was a very narrow entrance with large wooden doors that opened into a passageway leading into the settlement. These are sophisticated defences meant to slow and channel attackers. There's nothing like this at this time anywhere closer than the Eastern Mediterranean. And they built these defences right away. It was the first thing these people did upon arriving in this place and making it their home. Clearly, Iberia in 2200 BC was an incredibly violent place. And right from the start, the El Agar elites could command a huge amount of labour. But their society became increasingly sophisticated and complex over the centuries, which is reflected in the architecture of their settlements. After the first phase at La Bastida burned down in 2025 BC, over the next hundred years, the settlement was fully reorganised with stone buildings, some of them monumental, and they built a huge reservoir that could hold over 300,000 litres of water. The final stage at La Bastida, from 1900 to 1550 BC, saw a dense layout of stone buildings of markedly different sizes, all packed in close to each other, with just a few narrow alleys between them. It makes you wonder what living here would have been like. Everything going on would have been hidden away and private. Ugaric society was characterised by this kind of control. Control of resources and people, physically and socially. The hilltop sites like La Bastida were the homes of the elites and those that served them. There were perhaps a thousand people living here. It's also likely these sites housed slaves for work like grinding the barley into flour and perhaps weaving textiles. But that's not where all the people of this society lived. 
there were other settlements in the lowlands and plains that were subservient to the power centres controlling them. La Bastida, for example, likely controlled a vast territory of over 3,000 square kilometres. Resources from the region, like barley or cattle, were collected and brought to the hilltop sites for storage and redistribution. Other lowland sites specialised in metalworking or textiles before the finished products were brought to the homes of the elites. These hilltop sites like La Bastida and Lorca and El Agar itself were probably the capitals of state-level polities. All the elite hilltop settlements shared the same funerary ritual characterised by burial underneath buildings. The bodies were placed in stone kists, artificial caves cut into the bedrock, large ceramic urns or in simple pits. They were usually individuals, but some had two bodies together and occasionally there were three or more. These customs were surprisingly standardised, with different specific grave goods depending on sex, age and social class. So what can these marvellous burials tell us about these people and their society? I've mentioned that control is one of the aspects that stands out for this society, and that's expressed in various ways in their material culture, most of all in objects like the pottery and jewellery included in the burials. They had just eight types of pottery, all undecorated, and the forms were standardised over 600 years across the entire geographical range of the culture. They were all made from the same kind of clay too, Imagine the level of cultural control exerted over the workshops producing these objects. No deviation was allowed. Imagine the authority and the confidence of the people in charge. One of the most outstanding kinds of pottery is the huge pithoi storage jars with a capacity of between 100 and 200 litres. These were used primarily to hold grain in central, sometimes fortified storage rooms. In this arid environment, they grew almost exclusively barley. I'll talk more about this at the end of the video, but the centralisation of the food supply for each region is one way, perhaps the most important way, that they exerted their control. The other pottery style that stands out is these famous goblets, basically bowls above a tall stem. They are thought to be involved in rituals and are associated with the richest graves. We know that Belbica societies, especially those in Iberia, involved ritual drinking, and other Bronze Age European societies also developed drinking rites. We see special cups from England and Denmark to Greece. Probably these communal rites included the swearing of oaths between, say, a king and his warrior retinue, or between two political leaders, and maybe to seal alliances at weddings and the like. More about that in a minute. As well as pottery, people were buried with metal objects like halberds and daggers initially, and later on swords, as well as axes, awls and chisels, and ornaments like bracelets, earrings, rings, beads and later, and rarely, the world-famous diadems. The specific system of grave goods distribution tells us about how society was organised, at least within the hilltop settlements, the regional capitals. 10% of the burials represent the elite class, the rulers, then 50% represent the middle class, and the remaining 40% are the lowest class, who were buried with just a pot, and some perhaps representing slaves who were buried with nothing. Initially, the tools and weapons were arsenical copper, and after about 1800 to 1700 BC, they began to use tin bronze too. Silver and, more rarely, gold were used for the jewellery, produced from regional mines and local workshops controlled by the elites. This fascinating 2022 study examined 68 individuals from a site called La Almaloya and compared their DNA, radiocarbon dates and archaeological contexts to understand kinship practices in El Agar society. They discovered that elite marriages were organised patrilocally. That means women moved to new towns to marry husbands who stayed put in their ancestral settlement. These people practiced reciprocal female exogamy, meaning the men sent their daughters and sisters off to neighbouring and distant settlements to be married there. And these settlements were ruled through patrilineal descent, meaning authority passed down father to son through the generations. They found evidence for pedigrees that extended up to five generations along the paternal line. They looked at the double burials, where an adult man and woman were buried together, within a few years of each other at least, which at some sites can be 20% of the burials, and found that they were married couples. Well, what they call unrelated mating partners. And in three cases, these marriages had offspring also buried here, who could be tracked with DNA testing. 
It never ceases to amaze me that they can do this kind of thing now, it's incredible. And they could also see that some men had children with more than one woman, suggesting either that a man could marry more than one woman at a time, or that they married a second time after the first one died. The status of women in this society has been much discussed because some women had these extraordinarily rich graves and some had these incredible silver diadems. I think they've found five now. Some argued that women were equals or even in charge in El Agar society. The reasoning was that women often had a greater quantity and variety of grave goods. Also, there are more women interred than men. And in the standardized burial rite, girls were given grave goods at an earlier age than were boys, suggesting they were considered to be women at an earlier age than their brothers. But the DNA evidence suggests a profoundly male-oriented society. The men were where the power resided, and their blood was tied to the land. As for the grave goods, it looks like with double burials, earlier grave goods were removed from the previous burial before the second one was put in. So if a man died, and then a few years later his wife died, his stuff was partly cleared out, and she was buried on top with all her finery. And perhaps the symbols of male authority were just simpler. The weapons with which he maintained his position in society, his position, and that of his bloodline. These weapons were not just symbols. Analysis shows that all of them have signs of use wear. They were all used for fighting. The weapons we call halberds were developed somewhere in Belbica, Europe, and spread from Ireland to the Carpathians. Maybe the style of fighting they required was especially effective and difficult to master, suitable for aristocrats rather than peasants. And maybe they also thought of it as the weapon of their ancestors. Eventually though, copper halberds were replaced by a clearly superior technology, the bronze sword. There are bodies showing wounds too, including one with a depressed skull fracture where a halberd was smashed into his head, which was probably protected by a leather helmet. Perhaps warfare also explains why more women were buried than men. More of the men were killed in fighting away from the home settlement, their bodies unrecoverable, and perhaps girls became women at a younger age because they could be married off sooner, while boys had to be strong enough to hold their own in battle before their coming of age ceremonies could be held. Despite it being a patriarchal society, elite women were undoubtedly held in high regard. One woman with a silver diadem was buried with her husband at La Almaloya beneath what's been described as a great hall. Not a home, but a huge meeting space, with benches lining the walls. I can well imagine both the king and the queen holding court here with the aristocracy sworn to them, making decisions on resource redistribution, local justice, marriage alliances, long-distance trade expeditions, and warfare, before they were ultimately buried together beneath the structure. Maybe I'm just being simplistic, but how can a woman who wore a silver crown in death not be respected and powerful in life? La Almaloya was a compact, dense settlement that archaeologists say looks just like what are called palace complexes in the eastern Mediterranean, like Minoan palaces, for example. They were the cultural and economic power centers of the elites, where they could store resources, oversee workshops, and exercise power. It's not clear how much direct contact they had with contemporary state-level societies in Europe and across the Mediterranean, but certainly there were trade links, because they imported things like ivory from Africa and the eastern Mediterranean, and amber from the Baltic. As the centuries progressed, these proto-urban centers gradually extended their political and economic control, until at the peak they held authority over 33,000 square kilometers, basically the whole of southeastern Iberia and their cultural influence extended even beyond that, where it looks like local elites try to emulate El Agar on a smaller scale. However, at around 1550 BC, the El Agar way of life came to an end. It's not totally clear why, however, some settlements were burned down at this date and were never reoccupied. Surely in some cases then, there was a violent end. We know from genetic testing that they were not conquered and replaced by outsiders, as their ancestors had conquered this land, so the violence must have come from within. Perhaps war waged between the settlements, or uprisings by the lower classes who could no longer be controlled. What may have sparked such conflict is that centuries of intense farming in this dry landscape eventually exhausted the environment, leading to food shortages and social collapse.
Over the centuries, this culture had focused increasingly on the production of barley as its principal food source. Previously, they'd grown wheat in pulses too, and they'd consumed flax, olives, and figs, although it's not known if they were cultivated or wild. Why would their agriculture have become a monoculture over time? Well, there's an argument that ancient states, like in Egypt and Mesopotamia for example, could only arise due to their utilisation of cereal grains specifically. Grains can be grown, transported and stored as a kind of taxation, and divided and redistributed by those who controlled them. Control of grains and the control of people were inextricably linked, resulting in a peasant or slave class tied to the land. And that's what we see in the El Agar culture. Barley is well adapted to water shortages, ideal for an area with little rainfall, and can grow in soils with medium to low fertility. It had low and variable yields, but those problems could be countered by constant land clearances and a sufficient labour source. I wonder how much of the conflict in this society was related to raiding for slaves. However, unlike in Egypt and Mesopotamia, there were no regular river floods to regenerate the soil for thousands of years. And in just a few centuries after about 1900 BC, successive barley harvests exhausted the soils. The system might have faced a final blow from a drought around 1600 BC, which may or may not be linked to the Thera volcanic eruption in the Aegean. The actual collapse probably took generations, with sites being abandoned over a period of decades before the way of life finally came to an end. The elites in their hilltop palace complexes might have lost control of the lowlands whose people moved away from the region. Their political and economic systems had been so integrated that as they broke down, the elite way of life could no longer be sustained, and eventually, many of the hilltop sites were abandoned as well. Where they went, we can't yet say for sure, although there are suggestions that some elites tried to set up Ugaric-type settlements further to the north. Some of the old hilltop sites continued to be occupied, but it's clear that the complex, state-level society had ended. There was now no division between distinct social classes. There were no more specialised workshops where multiple workers, or slaves, ground flour, weaved textiles, or hammered metal. Instead, work was carried out within the homes. Social organisation had become flatter again, with resources distributed more evenly. There were no more magnificent burials. Life was on a smaller scale, with smaller settlements, and more diversity between them. People ate a wider variety of food, including more hunted animals. Central control over economics and culture had come to an end, and by about 1550 BC, the El Agar culture was no more. You know, the more I read about the Argaric culture, the more I was reminded of a contemporary society in Central Europe that I've mentioned many times on this channel, the Unatika culture. They also existed between about 2200 to 1600 BC. They also descended in part from the Belbica culture. They used bronze halberds and they had unbelievably wealthy elite burials. They might also have been a highly organised state-like society and they had an enormous influence on European history. They deserve a video too, so please subscribe now if you want to see that one in future. Remember, if you want to find out more about your own ancestry with my heritage, please use the link in the description and be sure to use the coupon code DAN, D-A-N, for free shipping. And there's that added bonus where you can get a 30-day free trial of my heritage's best subscription for family history research. This is also a great way to help support the channel and the work I do here. Now, to find out more about the Bell Beaker culture as it relates to Britain, please watch this video on the remarkable burial of the Amesbury Archer. Thank you for watching.